I am Jessica Smith and I um, run a bookkeeping and tax firm. I specialize in small businesses and individuals who are 10 and 9 contractors. I help them get their business in order and I like to save people money. So that's kind of my business model right now. And um, we're going to talk a little bit today about planning for taxes year round. So, let's so see. obviously every individual, every business is subject to taxes. We've got to love the IRS and our government. And um, part of running your own business is you are you open yourself to a lot, a greater tax liability. And um, as a self-employed individual and as your role as a bookkeeper, um, my goal is to reduce your total tax liability and save you money in the long run. So this is my information. Please take it down because I don't have business cards today. And <laughs> I apologize about that. I have them on order. But I am a certified bookkeeper and a registered tax return preparer. Um, I am a degreed accountant. I have a degree in accounting. I am not a CPA. However, I can do everything a CPA can, can do at a fraction of the cost. So if you need some assistance with anything, please let me know. Um, as of the end of this year, I'm looking to transition to um, an enrolled agent, which is a tax specialist in the eyes of the IRS. And I will have a capability to help people in case they are audited by the IRS. So it'll kind of be a little bit of a higher power, a little bit a little bit of a specialty in that regard um, with more specialized tax information. So we're just going to go over a couple of the topics that we're going to cover today. Um, obviously there is there is the importance of accurate record keeping. Um, we're going to discuss the IRS regulations and requirements for compliance with regarding to record keeping. And then we also are going to develop a simple method for organization. Um, we're, going to we're going to look at maximizing your tax deductions. As a self-employed individual, um, you're obviously taxed on the net income of the business. So you have the total profits, and then you have any business expenses, which gets you to your net taxable income. And the goal is to reduce that dollar amount as much as we can to reduce the total taxes that you would pay. So we're going to talk maybe about the possibility of hidden business write-offs specific for your industry. And then we're also going to just talk about reduce, reducing your total tax liability. And then we are going to get into a little bit regarding the dreaded IRS audit because this does happen. So we're going to discuss a little bit um, about audit risk and then we're also going to discuss um, the ways that we can respond to an audit should that, should that happen. What are my record keeping obligations? So every business whether you are a sole proprietor or a uh, corporation or an independent contractor in this regard, every business is required to keep accurate account, an accurate account of their business related income and expenses which are um, input into their income tax return. So you are required by the regulations of the IRS to have some formal record keeping, something to substantiate the income you report in your tax return as well as the expenses. So these records should be maintained for a period of up to seven years from the date of which you filed your income tax return reporting those income and expenses. So everyone should have filed their tax returns for the 2012 tax year filed by the 15th of April. Um, so if we wanted to maintain those records, I want to keep them seven years from the time I filed my return, which was this year. So I have seven years from now before I will destroy or, or get rid of those records from 2012. And while your records do not have to be electronic, um, it is recommended that all businesses use some form of computerized accounting to prevent errors and potential fraud by employees. Um, there is nothing wrong with having a manual set of books to record income and expenses. However, when you get into a um, position where you might have employees who will be helping you record information into your bookkeeping, um, it does open you up to the possibilities of fraud because it's a lot less difficult. It's a lot less. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a lot easier to hide transactions in a manual set of books. Um, computerized accounting. A lot of them have audit trails, and you can give uh, specific passwords um, to certain employees to only access certain aspects of your records. Um, and computerized accounting, it's it's pretty easy. There are a lot of programs out there that are designed for individuals and small businesses to make the system 
fairly easy, so you can do it on your own. Yes? So the seven-year thing, is that uh, stating also that you can be audited for up to seven years after a given tax year? Right. So the way that the IRS works is you have, um, if, it's, if it's not a fraudulent situation, you have um, three years from the time that your tax return is filed. And then the rule is if the IRS believes there is fraud, then they have technically seven, but realistically, if the IRS wants to audit you back 20 years, they, they could. Um, seven years is kind of the norm, because even though we expect people not to commit fraud, sometimes they do mistakenly not include income, not include expenses, um, and might have information on their tax return that isn't correct. So my policy is seven years, so you kind of at least have those records should they decide beyond that three-year time period to audit you. OK. So I devised a very simple method of organization for the majority of my clients. Um, a lot of people that I used to meet with in the past, they would get so caught up on having this very extensive, detailed file cabinet with all these different areas that they had to go to just to pull a source document for maybe the one transaction that I was asking questions about. And I got tired of it. I said, there's no need to have this extremely detailed file cabinet that no one can navigate except for the business owner. You need to have something that anybody who needs to uh, locate a source document for a transaction, that they can find it. So my first piece of advice, invest in a file cabinet or a file portfolio to hold all of your records. Um, ideally, something that locks. If you're going to keep personal information there, we want to keep it locked up. But um, a single file cabinet is usually plenty. Now, if you have you know, a large practice, you have lots of employees, you might have to invest in more than one. But just a good, solid file cabinet or file portfolio will be helpful. And we keep everything in the same one. And then I broke everything down into five main files or main categories that every business needs to keep. So the first it, <clears throat> excuse me, is related to your income or your money in. So this is any invoices or sales receipts for um, services or items that you, you sell in your, in your practice. The next one is expenses or money out. This would be bills, cash and credit receipts, and then um, purchases as well. You want to keep copies of your bank statements. And these are used to reconcile your bank accounts to your bookkeeping, verify which items have cleared. And then we're also going to have um, employee records. So you're going to have employment applications, pay stubs, timesheets. Um, there are specific rules relating to employee records. Um, there are IRS compliance um, concerns that we have with that. That is not my specialty. I do have a payroll provider that I could refer anybody to should you want additional information about the compliance, um, the compliance concerns with, with employee records. And then the final is um, a folder specific for tax agencies and payments. So we have the Board of Equalization, the IRS, and EDD. These are pretty common here for, um, for California. But these are the five main files I recommend. And again, we can expand upon each of those expense categories or each of these categories um, to be a little bit more specific. Obviously, if you have several employees, you would have an individual file for each employee. But ideally, everything kind of goes in that, that main host file or area of your file cabinet so it can be easily located. So again, just some tips I have here. Obviously, all personal information must be stored in a secure environment. If you choose not to have a paper file, that's fine. Electronic copies are totally acceptable. Uh, we just want to make sure everything has either a password or a physical lock so that if, if it were to be compromised, that nobody's information would be, would be stolen. And again, stick with the five main files. You can add subfiles when necessary, um, but the purpose of your method of organization, it should be simple. Um, if you do have someone in your practice maintaining your books for you, if they, need to go to an, if they need to find an expense, they should be able to go to the expense folder. They shouldn't have to look in you know, 
vendor, this vendor's location, this specific bill, and oh, it was in this state, so it's going to be in this folder. They go to one folder, they maybe look for that specific vendor, you might have a folder for that specific vendor, but they can locate it just by going to those host files, and it should, should take care of uh, the confusion on those items. And again, we should be separating business income and expenses from your personal income and expenses. Um, this is typically done very easily just by having two separate bank accounts. Um, a lot of people, if you are self-employed or a sole proprietor, um, your money is your money. You don't technically or legally have to have a separate bank account, but it is recommended. Um, it will be easier in the long run if you do have someone helping with your bookkeeping. You're only furnishing your business bank statements, not your personal bank statements, which might have business-related income and expenses recorded, um, and you don't have to worry about your personal information being given to that person. And I like to say make the habit of taking good notes. Um, and specifically, when you meet with a client, um, I don't know how frequently everybody would take a client maybe to lunch to discuss potentially doing business in the long run, but if you are going to have an occasion like that, I always recommend keeping a copy of the receipt with, with some notes written on it, something to kind of distinguish why that expense was incurred. Maybe you purchased food for a catering event. Obviously, here we have coffee and bagels. I would recommend that Angela write on her mm -hmm. receipt, purchased for such and such event, and then she maintains that receipt in her record book. Um, but she has substantiated why she purchased those items. And so we always want to take good notes. Another thing, um, I don't know if anybody here travels frequently for their position, however, mileage is deductible when you travel to several locations or if you're a mobile, um, a mobile, you're offering a mobile service. So it is important to keep a log of your mileage. Um, in the long run, if you have a written log, it's much easier to furnish to the IRS when it's already done than having to retrace your steps when they say, we need you to substantiate the mileage that you put on your tax return. So now we're going to get into what your tax obligations are. And I'm going to compare a W-2 employee to a 1099 independent contractor. Okay, so if you are a W-2 employee, federal and state taxes are withheld from wages based on the amount earned in a payroll period. So you have, um, as a W-2 employee, you are subject to income tax. Social Security, Medicare, and Disability. And these are some of the taxes that you physically pay withheld from your check, so it's money you never see. As a 1099 employee or self-employed individual, you're required to make estimated tax payments, um, and these are typically estimated income tax payments. They're made to the IRS and state each quarter equal to the expected tax liability for that year. That is a requirement. If you are not doing this, you are opening yourself up to pay penalties. There's penalties that you pay when you don't pay enough throughout the year. It's called the underpayment penalty and it's figured on the total tax that you have due for the year. So it doesn't matter if you've made payments and you only didn't pay $20 of that tax, you're still subject to a penalty based on the entire taxable amount. So it's important to be making estimated payments at minimum equal to 90% of your expected tax liability or 100% of your prior year's tax liability to avoid that underpayment penalty. Is there a threshold that you need to annually reach before you have to do the quarterly? Nope, if you're self-employed, you, you must do quarterly. That's the rule. Because when you're, when you're a W-2 employee, your employer is already making those quarterly payments for you. They have the federal withholding, the state withholding, and they send that to the IRS and the state. Um, as a self-employed individual, um, you're not, if you're not making those quarterly payments, the IRS and the state, they look as if you're not meeting those payroll requirements. They need that money throughout the year in order to fund everything that apparently they're paying for. So we are required to make those estimated ta tax payments. W-2 employees. So as a W-2 employee, you have your employer that actually pays a portion of uh, certain taxes that are required. Um, by the IRS and the state. So you have Social Security and Medicare. So as an individual, excuse me, as a W-2 employee, the employee pays one half of the Social Security and one half of the Medicare. And the employer actually matches it. So your employer pays a portion of those taxes on your behalf for your benefit. 
and the employer also pays the federal unemployment tax and the state unemployment tax for um, on your behalf. So these are not taxes that, that you pay, but your employer pays them. And so these taxes are deductible to the employer as a payroll expense. So this is the fun part. So as a 1099 self-employed individual, the IRS wants to still collect the employee or the employer matched wages. So as a self-employed individual, you are also subject, in addition to your income tax, a 15.3 FICA or self-employment tax. So on your total wages, you will be paying 15.3% to make up for these taxes that are not being withheld from your, from your payroll. And only half of the FICA tax is deductible. And the uh, IRS allows you to deduct half of those FICA taxes to kind of put you in a similar position that the employer would have. The employer has a benefit of deducting those uh, taxes, so they at least give you the benefit of deducting one half of those taxes that you're going to pay. And again, the lovely refund that we typically receive as a W-2 employee. Um, your income tax is entirely based on the estimated amount that you're going to earn for that year. It's based on your salary or your hourly wages. Um, so it's typically, in some cases, higher than um, what a self-employed individual might pay. So you usually get a refund. And again, self-employed taxpayers are more likely to owe additional tax when filing their income tax return. This is a common question. How do I pay less tax each year? And there are ways to do it. So the first one is to stay up to date on your record keeping. If you're taking an entire year's worth of receipts and trying to account for the total income and expenses that you earned and spent for that year, considering the deadline for taxes and everyone panicking, oh my gosh, I have to file taxes by this date, you are a lot more likely to make a mistake. My recommendation, if you can put aside one hour every week, or if you're going to hire a professional, hire a professional to do it, um, but stay up to date. You, you, will, you are far less likely to miss um, deductions when you're doing it on a regular basis. Again, let's pay our tax obligations on time. We all know it sucks to pay quarterly taxes. Uh, I don't like making estimated tax payments, but I also don't like having to pay a penalty because I didn't pay enough. Um, keep more money in my pocket if I can at least pay at minimum whatever I need to to avoid those um, underpayment penalties. And I have less of a hit as well when it comes to tax time. I'm not trying to come up with the total tax for an entire year in a short few months, whereas if I pay quarterly, it's a little bit less stressful. So the next one I recommend is spending your money wisely. Now, there's a lot of ways as a business owner you can spend your money. Ideally, when you are out on the field and you're deciding to purchase items for your business, look at those expenses as if they truly are tax deductible. Are you purchasing supplies for your practice or are you purchasing items that could be used for personal use? Realistically, we want to spend more money on business related expenses because that will reduce our tax liability. Um, another recommendation Contribute to an IRA. It's a benefit to you. Everybody needs to plan for retirement, and uh, your contributions to an IRA, a traditional IRA, are tax deductible. There are other plans you can contribute to. I will not get into that. I have a financial advisor that will eventually speak to you guys about the benefits of different retirement plans. Um, but it's a benefit. If you're going to spend money either way, you can either pay it in taxes and never get it back, or you could contribute to an IRA and potentially have that benefit down the line. You could donate to a nonprofit. However, I will tell you that charitable donations increases your audit risk significantly. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate nonprofits, yes. You can definitely donate to a nonprofit. You just want to be cautious because I did have a, um, there was an article recently about a couple that donated $25,000 to their church. Had records. They received the statement. However, the church did not specify how those funds were being used. That's the rule. The, the nonprofit must provide you not only with a statement, but they must provide you with where those funds were applied in order for it to be tax deductible. So that, those, um, that tax, those taxpayers 
had to then pay income tax on an additional $25,000 when the uh, IRS said, nope, you can't claim deduction because it did not meet all the rules. So be cautious with charitable contributions unless you are guaranteed from that uh, organization to get, to get all the record requirements, especially if you're going to make a significant donation. Those are fine. Those are fine. And again, charitable contributions, they really only benefit you if you itemize. If you don't itemize, you will not get the benefit of the contribution. Um, charitable contributions written off by a business is not advised um, unless you can truly substantiate those expenses um, because the IRS wants them put onto a different form as an individual. And even to qualify for that deduction, you have to meet this threshold. So they, they prefer businesses not have significant charitable contributions to kind of write off that income. And again, consult with your tax professional. Um, one recommendation is to form a separate business entity. Um, a good recommendation for anybody, form an S-Corp. It significantly reduces your taxes. Um, I'll just give you a quick example. So if we have... Ben, he's a 1099 employee. Then we have Bob. He formed an S-Corp. They're both in the same line of work, so they both have a total income of $50,000. Okay. Ben is subject to that 15.3 on his total income. So at 15.3%. So now he already off the top of it, off the bat has $7,600 in self-employment tax that he must pay. That does not include income tax. He's also subject to income tax on this $50,000, less one half. Because it is a deduction. Less his standard deduction. Less his exemption. And he's subject to, I believe, 25% on that. It's a marginal rate, but let's see. And this is assuming they're both single in income tax. So these are the two taxes he's going to have to pay. Now if we take Bob, Bob is an S-Corp. The rules with being an S-Corp is if you are a single member S-Corp, you're required to take a salary and pay payroll taxes. So let's say Bob's salary is $30,000. He pays his 12% payroll tax on, 30, on just $30,000. So he has $3,600 in payroll taxes. However, wages and payroll taxes are a deduction to the S-Corp. Okay. This thirty thousand is only subject to income tax, and then this is then added back. So his net income here, so he has forty six forty subject to is fifteen percent. Or I think he's twenty five percent actually. So that's a significant difference as far as the tax savings because he's not sub. They're not subject to the self-employment tax on the total income that they earn. They're only subject to, you're only subject to income tax and those payroll taxes on the salary for which you draw. And then again, you're, you, would, you reduce the total income by the salary plus any payroll taxes that you pay on their behalf. So there is a benefit to forming a separate business entity. Um, the other benefit? <coughs> As a S Corp or a separate entity, you allow, kind of open yourself to different tax credits and deductions. 
Um, I know that in California, which is kind of great, if you pay for health insurance for an officer or an employee, you can get approximately 25 to 35% of those premiums that you pay as a credit on your income tax return. So if you're gonna buy, or if you're gonna pay for health insurance already, if you form a separate entity, you could actually get a portion of that refunded to you. And it would take off, it would take off the total tax that you owe. Can you explain the difference between that and say as an employee, or as a self-employed person having, just paying your premium and getting that as a deduction? So when you are a self-employed individual, um, your health insurance premiums are deductible on a Schedule A. So you must itemize. You must itemize, um, your itemized deductions must exceed your standard deduction. And the rule with medical related um, expenses and premiums, they must exceed 7.5% of your AGI. So if your AGI is $50,000, you can only deduct in excess, you can only deduct the expenses that are greater than 7.5% of that. So most people, I know health insurance premiums are expenses, are expensive, but realistically, most people probably won't exceed their standard deduction in medical related expenses. And um, it's a benefit to, to have an S Corp because now it is deductible on your, on your, uh, your tax return and you potentially get that credit. The difference between a deduction and a credit, <coughs> a deduction reduces your taxable income. So it reduces the total dollar amount that you pay taxes on. A credit actually reduces the tax that you owe dollar for dollar. So after you figure your taxable income, you figure your tax, and then if you have a credit, dollar for dollar reduces that amount. So a credit's actually a better benefit. Um, the other thing I would say that I appreciate about forming maybe an S-Corp is when you are self-employed, you are not paying into the state disability program. If you were to become disabled at your position, how would you continue to earn a wage if you weren't paying into disability? You'd have to purchase a separate disability policy, right? You might also consider purchasing a life policy. Let's say you have things to protect. If you, if you were to die, what would happen to your practice? So those two policies, disability is, is deductible on a self-employed level. Life insurance is not. When you become an officer of an S-Corp, you can deduct your disability insurance premiums and your life premiums because it's a benefit to the officer. The company is then giving the officer that benefit of those premiums. With an S Corp, you don't have to have like the officers at least in the file of it. That's just a C Corp. Um, as an S Corp, you have to have three. There's three directors. You have like a director, secretary, and they can be all the same person. The, the, the rules with the S Corp, the, mm -hmm, the rules with an S Corp are a lot more lenient than those of a C Corp, and I would not recommend small businesses or individuals to form a C Corp because you open yourself to double taxation. The other great thing, <laughs> S Corp is not subject to federal income taxes um, on a corporate level. So it's a flow through agency. This dollar amount is then transferred onto an individual tax return. As a C Corp, they're taxed on a corporate level and then any shareholders are then distributed an income that they earn, which is also then subject to income tax. So. It's a great entity. I'm actually forming an LLC at the end of the year with my S election. Um, definitely if you want to consider forming an S Corp or forming maybe an LLC with your S election, um, there are some attorneys you could speak to that could advise the, the best option. But it's, it's really good. Reducing your total tax liability, this is one of the best ways to do it. And this is what a lot of people recommend in the long run. <coughs> and again, Consulting with your tax professional will determine, will help you determine which costs are fully deductible and which costs have to be deducted over a period of time. So if you purchase a computer in your first year of business, it is not fully deductible. It is an asset to your business and the dollar amount that you spend on that computer is deducted over a period of three to five years, depending on the useful life for that product. Would you want to spend $3,000 on a computer if you didn't think you could get the benefit of deducting it all in that first year? Possibly, possibly not. But there are, there are expenses which you can incur that are not going to be fully deductible in that first year. And a tax, consult, a tax professional will at least be able to advise you on, um, you know, if you have some business to start up costs, which costs 
you maybe want to spend your money on that are fully deductible versus ones you might have to deduct over a period of maybe longer than three or five years, sometimes or 10 or 15 years. So that's a long time to get the benefit of, of those deductions. All right, so we'll just get a brief, <laughs> let's talk about IRS audits. <laughs> So the IRS audits approximately 1% of income tax returns. This is 1% every year. So if you think you're never going to get audited because it's 1%, eh, odds are you probably will. I've been audited three times. Tax returns can be selected for audit up to three years from the year which uh, taxes are filed. So as we said earlier, everyone should have filed their taxes for the 2012 tax year by the April 15th of this year. So we would maintain our records for a minimum seven years, but the IRS could audit you know, within the three years from the time they're filed. So we have three years from 2013 for our 2012 records to be subject to an audit. Why then do we need to hold it for seven years? I've always heard seven years. The reason is it. But they could audit up to seven years. They, OK, so on a civil level, if you just made an honest mistake on your tax return, they have up to three years to audit it. If they believe you committed fraud, the rule is seven years. However, realistically, if they wanted to audit you 20 years down the road, they could. Um, but that's kind of the rule. Seven years for, f not because, I wouldn't tell someone, save your records for seven years if you believe you're going to lie to the IRS. But realistically, if, if they have, if they believe that you've done something wrong, if you keep those records for seven years and you could substantiate those deductions, you know, when they decide to audit you at that point, you kind of cover your butt. So seven years is kind of the norm, um, but it's, the rules technically are three years for just honest mistakes for when the tax return is filed. So if you file a return, so let's see, I have a couple clients right now. They never filed 2011. So they're filing to their 2011 return for this year. Again, the return is filed in 2013. It's three years from the time it's filed before you would um, kind of be in the clear for, for a potential audit on that. So many IRS audits are triggered when information received from, ta from the taxpayer. So what you formally submit on your income tax return, if it doesn't match the information that the IRS receives, whether it's received from employers, maybe whoever uh, provided you a 1099, that's also submitted to the IRS. Um, I don't know if anybody's had maybe a cancellation of debt or they've received a dividend, but all these 1099 forms are tr uh, sent to the IRS and when the, <clears throat> excuse me, when your income tax return is then received, the IRS compares, compares everything. If they find a difference, typically that triggers an audit. That's been my issue. I had one year that just kind of put me in a pickle. I claimed my son on my tax return. His dad claimed him on his tax return. <laughs> it, was not, it was not fun, so we had to go back. His dad had to amend his tax return because I was the one legally entitled to the, deduct entitled to the deduction. But it was a pain in the butt. Now I'm on the radar, and they audit me almost every year. So it's fun. They, find, they have to find something wrong. Um, but obviously, I keep good records, and I can substantiate my income, my deductions. And I'm very conservative on my tax return for that reason. So we'll just kind of go over the types of audits. Um, the most common is a correspondence audit. So this is where the IRS sends a letter indicating corrections to your tax return. And all the correspondence is made by mail. This is super common. Um, again, the IRS receives information that is different from what you tr transmitted on your tax return. Um, usually it's forms that maybe were forgotten or maybe income that you didn't know you received wasn't reported, which is why uh, records are super important. Um, if the IRS receives three 1099s and they total $10,000, but you only report an income of $9,000, obviously there's a difference. So we want to keep those records so that it doesn't matter if we receive a 1099 or not. We've reported the income because we recorded all of that income into our bookkeeping system. Um, the great thing about the correspondence audit is there's no, there's really not the worry of having to deal with an individual in your face saying, show me this, show me that. Um, they, they're very specific. They say, this is what we want to see and um, you provide them the information. Um, there are cases where the IRS could still be wrong. Um, in the case where I had a client who um, has a retirement account 
and the tax preparer for which she worked with um, did not put the basis or the contribution that she initially, initially made to her retirement account. Um, so when the IRS gets the tax return, all they see is these withdrawals from her retirement account. It looks as if she's got all this income that she has not paid income tax on. So they hit her with a huge bill, huge bill, thousands and thousands of dollars. So she comes to me and um, we get the 1099 form. We report all of the contributions she made into those items that she then sold or those shares that she sold. And she was actually at a loss. She lost money on the stock market and did not, in fact, have all this income that they believed that she had earned. So we reduced this huge tax liability to zero. And I still have her text message that says, thank you so much, Merry Christmas. After a year, again, a year we worked on this, um, she got a letter from the IRS saying that she owes zero for that tax year. So they can, in some cases, you can fight them. Um, so there, that would be definitely someone to speak, speak to your tax professional on that. The next one is a field audit. And this is where um, the IRS will send an auditor or a group of auditors to examine a business's documents and records. Um, did anybody see, oh, what was that? What's that Will Ferrell movie? Yes. That is an example of a field audit. They go to your location. They say, please provide me with your bookkeeping. And sweet little business owner says, here's my shoebox of receipts. You can't do that. You're, they're going to make you record it, but they are going to verify um, your income and, and deductions um, to make sure that it's accurate. They want to make sure that nobody's cooking the books or hiding income, over, overstating expenses to reduce their income, their tax liability. And this is common specifically for businesses. Um, a individual probably will not have a field audit. So the next one we have, or the final one, an in-office audit, and this can be individuals or businesses, but simply the IRS would require you to um, substantiate documentation <clears throat> on their tax return at an IRS location. I've never been at an in-office audit, knock on wood. I've sat on a field audit. Field audits are scary. <laughs> it is very intimidating having an IRS agent sit at the other end of the table and say, We've reviewed your, your records and we've noticed that this income was not reported. If the income not reported is substantial enough, you will be going to jail. So they, they can be very scary. But for the most part, the correspondence audit is what, what everyone will experience. So these are just some basic factors for what increases your IRS audit risk. Obviously, not filing your tax returns. If you have historically always had a job and then you don't have a job, that's a little bit easy to understand because if you don't earn any money, you don't have to file a tax return. Um, but yes, not filing tax returns, you might get a little notice saying, we didn't receive this from you today. <laughs> Failing to report all taxable income. And this is a big one because again, if, you have, if you're working for, um, for someone who's providing you a 1099 and you aren't reporting all the income, it gets reported to the IRS in one form or another. So you want to make sure you're reporting all the income that you earn. Reporting large losses on your business as a sole proprietor. This is a big one. The IRS wants you to earn money. <laughs> they understand that you have to live. So if you are a sole proprietor and you have a total taxable income of zero or you have a huge loss, where is this other money coming from? Now again, it's not unusual if you worked for 10, 20 years and you've got several hundreds of thousands of dollars in a bank and you say, oh, I decided to take on this business venture, so I have money in the bank to draw against. That would be a common situation if you had losses from your business because you're, you're a startup. But if you have a huge loss for a long period of time, it's a problem. They, they know you have to live, so you're going to have expenses that maybe would not be deductible from your business. Deducting expenses in whole or round numbers. Now, sometimes this happens. I've seen this on a couple returns. I'm like, uh, it's too, you have too many zeros at the end. You know, you have $5,020 instead of $5,023, or you have, you know, $4,500 instead of $4,504. Round numbers and whole numbers, if that's all that you have, 
could trigger an audit because the way the IRS looks at that is maybe you're just guessing. You may not have receipts to substantiate those items. So on the rare occasion that it really does happen that way, I, I usually add a one um, or maybe a two here and there. Um, doesn't really affect the total tax that they're going to pay, but it'll kind of lessen the audit risk because it doesn't look like you're just guessing on those expenses. Silly question. Mm -hmm. Are you supposed to just drop the coin, or do you round up? Um, you round up 50 cents, 50 cents the higher you round up, 50 cents or lower you round down. However, the rule with most tax preparers is you round down on income, you round up on taxes that were paid. So if you have a W-2, um, if they earned you know, $30,155 and 50, 50 cents, you'd want to round down on the total income because they're taxed on the income. But if they paid taxes for like five thousand nine hundred ninety-nine and forty-nine cents, you would round up because that would show that they paid more in taxes. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> Another thing, unfortunately, taking the home office deduction can trigger you for an audit. Realistically, a lot of people work from home. The IRS will let you take the deduction, but the rule is you have to let them audit you if they want to. Um, you must have a area solely dedicated just for office use. So if you have your office in your children's room, it's not eligible for the tax deduction. If you run your, um, uh, if you run a portion of, let's say you run a portion of your practice, let's say you have a garage that you um, habilitated into an office for you. If you have an entrance into the garage to access a laundry room, it's not eligible for the home office deduction. It must be solely used for the purpose of business, okay? And they're actually changing some of the rules next year, which is kind of cool. Before, the home office deduction was based on a percentage of maybe the total expenses that you pay, your rent, your utilities, whatnot, a percentage based on the business use. Now they're doing a standard rate where they're going to give you, I believe, $5 per square foot of dedicated office space, so you'll have a standard rate as opposed to telling them how much you paid for all those other expenses. Ideally, if you're going to take the home office deduction, you want to make the percentage compared to your total square footage to be about 20% or less. Um, realistically, unless you have a huge location, your home office should not take up more than 20% of the total space for which you, for which you live in. Yes. Like you said, there's like you know a bed in the back, and the whole room is 200 square feet. Can you take 150 square feet? There would have to be a separation of some kind of partition to separate it. So um, if you are able to set up like a faux wall, or make it its own its own uh, area, then it can it can typically qualify. They just they want to avoid people taking this home office deduction who are just paying bills from their, their home office. Does that make sense? They want to make sure it's really business related. I mean, like myself, I have, um, I only, the only location I could put my office is, is downstairs where my dining room table would be. So I have just this one space, but I do have a living area separated by a couch where my son plays with his toys and whatnot. Um, in my line of work, it's a little different. Realistically, yes, when I work, I'm, I'm literally doing work at my home office. Um, you might have someone who has a different storefront, and maybe their home office, they do minimal work. Maybe they answer a couple emails or, again, pay bills. It's those types of situations. They don't want you to take this home office deduction because, realistically, you're not doing the majority of your work at home. You probably have another location that you already have the benefit of deducting rent and utilities from that location, not necessarily from the business use of home. As, um, if you're an employee, but you take your work home and you have a special office. Yes, that would be different. And typically, you would want to file like an unreimbursed employee expense situation. Um, and typically, I recommend in those situations to have some kind of formal written agreement with your employer that you're allowed to take work home, as opposed to just taking work home on your own. And then this is probably the biggest um, 
the biggest trigger, reporting deductions greater than industry standard. The way, one way that the IRS will select people for audit, aside from it being completely random, um, they will take several standards for people within your industry and compare them. Okay, is your income in line with this industry? Okay, if your income is in line with this industry, now are your expenses also similar? If you have the same income amount as a thousand people in your industry, but your deductions are 30% higher than those other thousand people, you could potentially open yourself up to an audit risk. Not everybody knows what the standard is, but realistically, if you're going to deduct a business expense and you could substantiate it and prove it down the line, you'll be okay. But we want to make sure that we're not deducting things that are not truly business related. And then real quick, as far as how to respond to an audit, review the correspondence right away. There is a deadline. You can always go back should the deadline expire, but it's a lot more difficult to work with the IRS after they've made their decision. Furnish only the information required, no more, no less. The letter will be very specific. They might say, you claimed this credit. Provide us the, this documentation that, that proves you, claim, you can claim it. That's all I'm going to give them. I don't want them to go into any other part of my tax return. Same thing where they might say, OK, we received this, this item here. If you can prove this, this will be waived. So you only provide them what they're asking. You don't need to go into detail, oh, but I did this, or I did that, or I did that. Just give them what they need, and hopefully they'll leave you alone. Be prepared to make payment arrangements if you cannot pay the additional tax owed. Um, with IRS audits, they, again, they have three years to audit you. If they find a mistake from a return from two years ago, and they stand by their decision to impose the additional tax, you pay penalties and interest from the date the tax was due, not from when they reassessed you. So you now have two years of penalties and interest that has been added to your total tax bill for not filing your tax return correctly in the first place. So if you are not prepared to make payment arrangements, or if you're not prepared to pay the balance in full, the IRS does have payment arrangements. There is, um, there is interests and other set up fees, but it is possible to make a payment arrangement. So just you're going to have to be prepared for that if you get an audit. And of course, consult your tax professional. I've helped lots of people with little spot audits. And um, ideally, when you have someone who knows the rules and knows ways to maybe reduce the IRS conclusion, we can, we can get your total tax due down to hopefully nothing. Mm -hmm.